HWA video team here interviewing Tananari Du, author, educator, and screenwriter. Thanks for joining us today. Great, thank you. So your mother was the civil rights activist, Patricia Stevens Du. Can you tell us what, uh, how her work as an activist uh, affected you as an artist? Yeah, that, I love that question. Actually, um, my mother uh, passed away in 2012, but such a very big presence in my life still, uh, and certainly in childhood. She, she and my father, John Dew, who's still living, he's 82, were met at Florida A&M University, where my mother was an activist. She was suspended many times for her activism. She and her sister, my aunt Priscilla Cousins, spent 49 days in jail. So sitting in at a World War I lunch counter, uh, refusing to pay their fines to be released. So they just stay in. And Jackie Robinson published a letter that was smuggled out of jail. He wrote a column for the, the New York uh, Post, I think it was. So I grew up hearing all these stories about sort of everyday heroism, not just what my parents did, but my mother always wanted me to understand what other people had done, people who didn't get national recognition, people whose names weren't known, but whose lives were tremendously affected, often for the worse, you know, people who were traumatized, uh, post-traumatic stress, uh, people who committed suicide. Some of the white students uh, who came down south were shocked <laughs> at what America actually was compared to what they thought it was. And, and those, uh, you know, she knew a couple people who committed suicide. So I grew up with those stories, which is kind of a horror, in and of itself, you know, I, 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 I was born in the 60s, but I didn't come of age until the 70s. So I never saw that world up close and as ugly as she did. You know, I, I've never had tear gas thrown in my face and, and I've never had people yell and spit at me in that way. So that in itself uh, created this sort of uh, understanding in my mind that uh, I was very, very lucky, but also a sense of what horror looks and feels like. And what fed into that is that my mom was a huge horror fan. I think that was a way of escaping the real world anger and fear, uh, misery that comes sometimes in resistance when, when you're not moving along as fast as you would like to. People you know are getting hurt, people you know are suffering. Mm -hmm. So she would watch those universal horror movies that were, and, and raised us watching the horror movies. And it really took on me and one of my sisters, you know, to this day, we will watch anything that's horror. And I, then I started reading Stephen King. So although a part of me uh, coming of age felt like I should go to law school like my sisters and be more of a traditional activist, my mother really did. Once she told me I went to jail so you wouldn't have to, basically, she really wanted to just sort of set us free to our potential. And unfortunately, the world is not such that any of us can all you know, just afford to fly free completely. <laughs> it's just there's so much work still to be done. We're seeing now. But she really wanted to bequeath that to us. And so she was super, super supportive, not just as a writer, but um, she was supportive of me as a horror writer specifically because she loved that. She loved horror. So I was very lucky in that way. So you teach a class at UCLA about Afrofuturism. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely, absolutely. Afrofuturism is uh, really uh, an encompassing term that was coined by a cultural critic, Mark Berry, in the 90s. But it really was speaking to a phenomenon that was already underway. Writers of color like Samuel R. Delaney, um, even W.E.B. Du Bois in 1920 wrote a short story called The Comet, where it was this post-apocalyptic story where the only survivors were a black man and a white woman. Uh, my husband, Stephen Barnes, had been writing long before that. Octavia Butler, obviously. But it was this term um, that speaks to a kind of futurism that centers uh, black people, you know, from around the globe. I've seen short films from Kenya, you know, I mean, it's for, so it's really sort of a global speculative arts movement, I'll call it. And I've written some science fiction and some futurism, but most of my writing is horror, so, so as you know. So when I say Afrofuturism, I'm really talking about that us arts, which is science fiction, fantasy, and horror. And even though they serve different purposes, all of these genres within Afrofuturism are just backward looking. It's like moving forward by going through history. So it's honoring and then it's 
centering ourselves and also showing ourselves in leadership position, which in the current presidential administration, I think there's a lot of hunger for that. Uh, a film like Get Out, for example, I consider Afrofuturism. And in the, the most uh, traditional sense, sort of as a social activist bent. I mean, not all Afrofuturism is overtly political. W.E.B. Du Bois obviously was being very political. <laughs> he wrote that story in the 20s. This is the era of lynchings. But, uh, and obviously, Jordan Peele was being very political. Get Out. It's not all that <coughs> overtly political. Sometimes it's an act of resistance just to portray yourself in the future. You know? So, like, even though uh, um, the original Star Wars, George Lucas' original Star Wars, basically didn't have any, any black faces. And this is an accident, and he corrected it like films, but that was what we grew up watching. So the future was devoid of us. And often when you look at black and white historical photos, I'm still caught, but I see one, because so often the history is devoid of us. You know, here's New York in a movie set in 1945 for the black people. <laughs> you know? It's almost like an excuse the casting directors have if it's a historical, that means, well, let's not bother to find any black people like Westerns are notoriously underrepresented minorities, you know, in a traditional sense. So, so yeah, that's what Afrofuturism is. So what projects are you working on now? Well, I'm writing a novel, uh, and also my husband and I are planning an upcoming webinar on Afrofuturism. It's called Afrofuturism, Dreams to Banish Nightmares. And it's all about the film, literature, and music that creates Afrofuturism and leadership is for artists, for activists, for people who are just curious and just want to maybe be more inclusive in your own writing. So it's www.afrofuturismwebinar.com. And we'd love to see you sign up. All right, well, looking forward to seeing you in April. Great, I'm looking forward to it too. And um, I, I have a short story collection out this summer that I want to mention has been optioned to a network. So everyone send me good vibes that, that actually gets off the ground and goes somewhere. And I look forward to seeing everyone at the uh, Stokers. All right, see you then. All right, bye-bye.